10 years, what will you be driving? How about 20 years or 50 years into the future? 50 years in the future could be Star Trek transportation pods. That's what it becomes. Science fiction has steadily predicted actual technological progress. You can push the envelope as fast as you want, but you got to be careful that you're not running by your public. Gaze into the future of automotive technology, and you'll find as many predictions as there are dreams and dreamers. One of the breakthrough technologies that will fuel the future is hydrogen. The things that we can do electronically are just absolutely mind-boggling. Cars won't just listen to our commands. They'll talk back. I'll be in the glove compartment if you need me. We see in the future the use of multiplexed electrical systems where we can coordinate a lot of different functions of the vehicle all at the same time. Cars will do more than react. They'll predict your every move. Know what you're going to do before you know it yourself. The automobile is going to be in touch with you very intimately. It won't be a passive automobile, it'll be very active, letting you know things at the right time, when you really need to know them. Aerodynamic design and ultralight materials will push the performance of future cars off the charts. The way it gets adapted from the racing will eventually make its way into everyday passenger cars. Hurtling into the future, we'll find technological wonders unimaginable today. But it took a rocky road to get there with surprising twists and turns that made for an incredible journey. For centuries, men like Leonardo da Vinci dreamed of inventing a horseless, self-propelled carriage. But it wasn't until 1769 that the dream became a reality when French army engineer Nicolas Cugnot mounted a primitive steam engine on a three-wheeled wagon. Historians regard the 1769 Cugnot as the world's first automobile. It was steam-powered with a tremendously large boiler sitting in front of the singular front wheel. Cugnot's car never panned out. From then on, inventors continued to experiment with steam-powered cars, while others were developing electric-driven vehicles. Both had their merits, as well as their limitations. By 1886, German mechanics Karl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler had developed two different cars, both powered by a brand new type of engine. Both built cars of their own, independent of each other. Each car was considered, in its own way, the first practical vehicle. Their propulsion system was the gasoline-powered internal combustion engine. The internal combustion engine is actually much more efficient, takes less space on the, uh, in the same car, and puts out more power than steam engines. These early one-cylinder engines worked very much the same as today's. A potent mist of vaporized fuel and air is compressed inside a cylinder. Then the spark plug fires, igniting a controlled explosion, which drives the piston downward. The pistons turn a shaft, which transfers that power to the wheels. At the bottom of the power stroke, an exhaust valve opens, and the vaporized fuel is expelled out from the cylinder. The system that worked the best at that time was an internal combustion engine using gasoline as a fuel. But the future of the automobile at this time was still in doubt. At the turn of the century, there were only 8,000 motor vehicles in the United States, meaning fewer than 1% of all Americans owned a car. You'd said to somebody, what about horseless carriages? What about, what about those as a future? They just said, what about it? There's no future in those things. Those are toys. But many saw the potential of the automobile as far more than just a novelty. In just a few short years, there were more than 200 companies making cars in the U.S. alone, primarily expensive specialty models. One of those companies was run by a young entrepreneur named Henry Ford. In 1908, Ford had an idea. His brainstorm? Simple was good. Cheap and simple was even better. The result? The Model T. Ford's Model T was the first practical, affordable car. Its four cylinders delivered a mere 20 horsepower, but its impact on the world was immeasurable. Up till that time, most automobiles were really playthings of the, of the rich. And Ford's goal was to make the automobile not a plaything of anybody, but something that could be a universal transportation device for literally everybody. And they were actually very technologically advanced little machines. They really were. They were elegant in the true sense of the word of being simple, sturdy, and almost completely dependable at that stage in automotive technology. It had an engine with a, a one-piece cylinder block, which was unusual for the time. 
he made extensive use of a steel alloy that made the steel both light as well as strong. So those things made the car rugged and it also contributed to his ability to manufacture it at a lower price. In the first year, Ford sold 10,000 Model Ts. When he introduced the moving assembly line in 1914, production leapt to 500,000 a year. By 1924, Ford was cranking out nearly two million cars annually. Half the automobiles on the planet were Ford's tin lizzies. Henry Ford wasn't surprised. The way he saw it, the Model T was all the car anybody would ever want. But Henry Ford had underestimated the American public. Popular demand for technological advances put Model T sales in rapid decline. To feed America's automotive hunger, Ford introduced the Model A in 1927. It had a three-speed transmission, hydraulic shock absorbers, and four-wheel brakes. But the public, as always, would soon demand more. After those plugs are cleaned and checked and your carburetor adjusted, you'll get more power and better mileage. Practically from the very beginning, drivers wanted more power from their small internal combustion engines. Most early cars had engines with four cylinders arranged in a row. Engineers felt that adding more cylinders to an inline engine was impractical because the motor would become too long to fit into an ordinary car. To solve the puzzle, engineers came up with an ingenious solution. Arrange the cylinders in a V pattern opposite each other. Bottom line, maximum horsepower with minimum engine length. Cadillac designed and manufactured the first mass-produced U.S. production V8 in 1914. But it was heavy and expensive to make. It wasn't until 1932, when Ford assembly lines rolled out a low-priced V8, that the engine became standard on many cars. In the 1930s, the world was suffering a crippling economic depression. But the car manufacturers vied to beat each other in the horsepower race to appeal to the remaining buyers who still had deep pockets. You had a few very wealthy people who weren't, simply weren't affected by the depression. They were still free to spend. And then you had the manufacturers coming out with V12 and V16 automobiles, cars with double overhead camshafts and four valves per cylinder during the late 20s and early 30s. You haven't begun to see what this car will do. All right, let's go. With the onset of World War II, car manufacturers turned their efforts to making war equipment. Technical advances in power plants, fuels, tire compounds, and plastics were all accelerated. After the war, the auto industry began building cars that, in both style and technology, left the tough times behind and embraced the optimism of the future. New features included automatic transmissions and power steering. Power steering is really simply a device to make the effort of turning the steering wheel, especially at low speeds, easier. Because it used to be with mechanical linkage, especially when you're in a parking lot, some drivers just plain weren't strong enough to turn the steering wheel. So the power steering system is just an assist to use fluid pressure to aid in turning the steering wheel. While power and comfort may have been most drivers' primary requirement, many were looking for the more exhilarating experience of a sports car. An era of change was about to take place in the U.S., and it began with America's first real sports car, the Corvette, which debuted in 1953. The Corvette is an American icon. Very early on, it became established as a symbol of youthful freedom, a little bit of rebelliousness, but in an acceptable way. The car was relatively affordable. It was fun. Although the Corvette was drop-dead sexy, it delivered more sizzle than steak. They had an anemic little six-cylinder engine, and although it had multiple carburation, it still wasn't as fast as a lot of European competitors. In 1955, the power plant was beefed up to a 265 cubic inch V8, and positraction and fuel injection were added in 1957. Chevrolet used it as a test bed for technology, and this is really what the public looked to it to represent. It really was a dream car, but it was a dream that people could go out and buy. It didn't disappear once they woke up. While the sexy two-seater might have been a dream car, many Americans were looking for a sports car the whole family could enjoy. Introducing the unexpected, the new Ford Mustang. Mustang, a brilliant new kind of car. We had the two-passenger Thunderbird, and they said, how do you make a successful sports car? 
you put two more seats in it. The flashy new Mustang trampled the competition. In 1964, almost half a million people bought one, more than any other automobile in its first year of production in history. The old adage, you know, if you build a better mousetrap, they'll find it quick, and they found it. It had everything, bucket seats, it, it was just a nice car. Well, we had the Falcon, so we had all the pieces. We had the engines, transmissions, and axles. All I did was reskin it, which was expensive, but just put a new wrapper on the baby. That's what it was. It was a Falcon that grew up into a sports car. The baby boomers who drove these sporty new cars might have worn love beads, but in their hearts, they hungered for raw power. Enter the muscle car. Yeah, and this was a decade of rebellion, and so the muscle car was the idea of taking the largest possible engine and stuffing it into the smallest possible car. And it's something that mothers hated and children loved, and, and it was just one of those things that had rebellion written all over it. The muscle cars of the late 60s and early 70s revolved around an off-the-showroom big block engine, some cranking out as much as 450 horsepower. Those engines work really good when they're trying to make lots of power. They had awful fuel economy, but at that time you could advertise drag racing quarter mile times, that's what people would buy. car that was successful like the Mustang, suddenly you want to put a big engine in, they put a 429 in, they had to go wider and heavier and all of a sudden the whole character changed in a 69 Mustang. Different animal completely. But the gas guzzlers were about to go thirsty. In 1973, Middle Eastern oil producing countries turned off the spigot. Suddenly, gasoline prices in Europe and America quadrupled. We ran out of gas, cost of fuel went up sky high. The traditional companies were still building big V8s that got 8, 9, 10 miles per gallon. There's a car that makes a man proud. It's the Toyota Corona. Japan and Europe were already making cars that were fuel efficient had decent performance and were affordable. American drivers' priorities slowly began to change. One thing, though, you may not be too popular at your favorite gas station. We brought those solutions to cars that were sold in America, and the customers were ready for them. They embraced this new technology. They've embraced lightweight cars. They've embraced better gas mileage. They've embraced lower emissions. They've embraced all of the concepts that we have perfected over the years in our home markets. Today, there are over a hundred million cars on America's highways. To make the next giant leaps into automotive technology calls for radical solutions. And the only way to win is to break all the rules. That's what today's engineers are setting out to do with a vengeance. Today there's about 300% the miles driven that there was in the 1960s. So if cars used as much fuel and polluted at the levels that they did then, we, we really would have to have a completely alternative way of getting around because we just couldn't live here. It would poison the atmosphere and we wouldn't be able to live. We've got to be responsible today in the automobile industry to make sure that we're part of the solution, not the pollution. We've got to make sure that we're making our vehicles compatible with the needs of the Earth tomorrow. This requires rethinking how we build our vehicles, how we design them, and how we power them. In 1900, 40% of all automobiles in the United States were powered by steam. 38% were electric and just 22% were powered by the gasoline internal combustion engine. Modern Marvel's car tech of the future will return on the History Channel. We spend a lot of time in our automobiles, so it is no wonder we want as many options as we can get to make our lives on the road easier, especially when we're stuck in traffic. Manufacturers have rightly recognized that people would like to be comfortable, they'd like to have their conveniences, the power options. You know, we have hands-free cell phone connections now and DVD entertainment, preferably for passengers only, not the driver. And those hot-looking extras, options, upgrades, and gadgets have been selling cars since the beginning of automotive history. Today's drivers take many of these accessories for granted. 